cyclists after being delayed two years due to COVID-19. Cyclists arrive in St. Louis after cycling 1,300 miles. President of the Seventh-day Adventist Church emphasizes the major accomplishments of Adventist Church departments and institutions linked to the General Conference. You can follow this and other news here on ANN Video. Since our last General Conference session in 2015, the world has experienced significant crises and undergone unprecedented change. According to the president of the Global Seventh-day Adventist Church, Pastor Ted Wilson, this shouldn't surprise us as Seventh-day Adventists. Prophecy foretells the condition of the world just before Jesus comes, and we are told in the spirit of prophecy that the final events will be rapid ones. The focus of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the leaders of the General Conference is to communicate God's final message of hope to every person in the world. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has always been based upon God's Word, the Bible. From the beginning, we've been a prophetic movement based on the sure word of prophecy. As we've followed God's counsel, He has blessed the church. In his report, the president, Pastor Ted Wilson, emphasizes the major accomplishments of church departments and institutions linked to the General Conference. The report shows that the church remains focused on mission, carrying the message of hope and providing service to our communities in times of crisis. The report included a glimpse of an extraordinary experience from the Philippines. For half a century, war raged between the Philippine Communist Party's New People's Army, NPA, and the Philippine government, causing the death of more than 40,000 people. Living in the remote mountains of Mindoro, one of the more than 7,640 islands of the Philippine archipelago, the communist rebels planned and trained for their ongoing war. Last November, Nancy and I had the great opportunity to participate in a nationwide evangelistic program called Earth's Final Countdown. It was a tremendous evangelistic experience with our church members and leaders in the three unions of the Philippines. This total member involvement outreach was coordinated by Adventist World Radio, and the division leadership in conjunction with Hope Channel. Despite the restrictions of the pandemic, thousands were baptized as a result of intense small group activities combined with comprehensive health ministry, as well as the thrilling work of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of former rebels in the mountains of Mindoro. In 2017, Adventist World Radio began broadcasting a series of evangelistic sermons and Bible studies across the island of Mindoro in preparation for a total member involvement evangelistic series. The broadcasts were an amazing success and approximately 1,400 people were baptized following the June 2017 evangelistic meetings. The broadcasts continued and unbeknownst to AWR, by 2019, even the rebels hiding in the mountainous jungles were listening. The Holy Spirit was doing a profound work in their lives. And in 2020, they surrendered their hearts to God and their guns to the Philippine government. Incredible reconciliation took place between the former rebel soldiers and Philippine soldiers as they embraced one another. The former rebels, now fully reconciled, were given amnesty by the government. And on November 13, 2021, hundreds of former NPA rebels clad in blue I Will Go t-shirts, along with their leader, Raimundo and his wife, Rose, were baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church in a ceremony on Mindoro. In concurrence with this event, other TMI presentations were given across the Philippines, resulting in 124,000 baptisms across that country as they listened to Earth's final countdown. TMI presentations. But God's work didn't end there. Believing in total member involvement and taking the 
I will go call seriously. These now fully reconciled believers return to their colleagues and friends preaching and sharing the Advent message with them. Again, the Lord moved mightily as more rebels and others gave their hearts to the Lord, resulting in 1,200 precious souls being baptized in Mindoro on Sabbath, April 9, 2022. The report concluded with an inspiring baptism, making it clear that God continues to guide the church, even in the midst of crises and challenges we currently face. We're now going to North America to see the work of the Adventist Church in this part of the world. Hello, friends, and greetings from the North American Division, the territory where the Seventh-day Adventist Church was born and where the 61st session of the General Conference is being held. In spite of the enormous challenges that we face arising from the pandemic and an increasingly violent world, it is with a sense of satisfaction that I present this report that shows you what we have experienced in recent years. And that's why we exist as a church here in North America, to bring a message of hope and wholeness to the world. God has tremendously blessed in our division over the past several years. This past quinquennium, plus 26 months of COVID-19, has been an adventure in ministry for the North American Division. Despite the challenges, we've seen God working in our division in miraculous ways through public evangelism, digital evangelism, and personal evangelism in innovative and creative formats in Bermuda, in Canada, in Guam, Micronesia, and in the United States. After the 2015 General Conference session, our ministry leaders at the North American Division were excited to reach our community with the Christ-centered message of hope and wholeness. We started our Plant 1000 Churches Initiative and celebrated close to 220,000 baptisms and professions of faith from 2015 to 2021. We held intense leadership meetings about church structure in North America and visited with more than 6,000 teachers at a convention in Chicago. Division leadership followed the GC's lead and gave the NAD a new visual identity with brand guidelines. We redesigned our corporate website and new service. We partnered with Adventist World to create our new magazine, Adventist Journey. As the pandemic arrived, we supported our church through two years of unexpected ministry challenges. In 2020 alone, the North American Division approved an unprecedented $10 million COVID-19 stimulus package to provide financial support to our conferences through their unions and we awarded nearly $1.5 million in Adventist Community Services Disaster Response, Foundation, Matching Grants, and Seed Grants that year. Over the seven years, we sent out over 2,700 long-term missionaries, and nearly a quarter of a million people served as short-term missionaries. We've seen God do some amazing things through some amazing people in the North American Division over the past few years. And I'd like you to hear their stories. Starting back in 2019, can we remember back that far? Can you remember back that far? Pastor, can you remember back that far? Thank you, Pastor. Let me tell you, our church was blessed in 2019, more than we knew back then. We had potlucks and hikes every Sabbath. My grandkids came over three times a week. The church had a tree planting team, a cooking class, and three study groups just on Wednesdays. We saw more than a thousand baptisms at Oshkosh. Pathfinders from Guam and the Micronesian Islands flew across the ocean for the campery. 50,000 people gathered in one place before we lost a chance. It was a gift. We broke a world record, the biggest human-made picture of a cross. Back home, our church was growing. All the seats of the church were filled up. I brought my neighbor to one of those 
old-fashioned summer tent meetings. She came back. I volunteered at the pop-up dental clinic in my town. Say, huh? Uh -huh. I helped my church back at home set up a live stream. I watched our tech team move mountains to get us online. Our faithful members give six person more tight than before the pandemic. I graduated on Zoom. Media. With media, we can connect online seekers to a thousand digital disciples. We remember our big cities and continue our mission there to mentor and to serve. And we're starting new initiatives through our churches, schools, and centers of influence. We don't know what comes next. But we'll meet it head on with each other and with God. What wonderful things were accomplished by the power of God and the total involvement of an entire church. We're now going for a short break and we'll be right back. Don't go away. Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. have a GC session and what happens during the meetings? We have the answers right now. The general conference session is the largest, most complex and significant event held by the global Seventh-day Adventist Church every five years. Postponed for two years due to the COVID-19, the meeting is scheduled to be hosted this year from June 6 to June 11 at America Center Convention in St. Louis, Missouri. According to the event organizers, the decision to move the 61st GC session from Indianapolis to St. Louis was made based on the venue availability. Indianapolis had a very full schedule for the year 2022, which is why the executive committee voted to move the session elsewhere. The city of St. Louis offered an attractive package to host the event. The place was also already known since he hosted the 2005 DC session. This year, for the first time ever, the GC session will be held in a hybrid manner. A digital infrastructure to host such a large event was created and significant changes to the schedule and format have also been required to make it easier for delegates to join from different corners around the world. Also, this year's session will be available in five languages, English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Russian. Therefore, there will be multiple Zoom sessions going on and a team of translators working in each room. A priority for the session organizers is to keep everyone safe and healthy. The event planning was designed with social distancing in mind. Delegates coming from nearly 200 countries along with technical staff, we will receive KN95 or N95 masks at registration. Hand sanitizing stations will be located throughout the America Center Convention Complex. There won't be any in-person exhibits this year. It will all be virtual. Likewise, with the musical part, there will only be a few live musicians. Most of the music will be virtual. This event is not only a business meeting, but is also a spiritual meeting. It is a time where we seek the Lord as we choose leaders and pray over them. It will be a time for members to gather physically and virtually to take care of the Lord's business. We can be sure that the 61st GC session entitled, Jesus is Coming, Get Involved, will be a great blessing for all of us who have this hope. 
The millennial Asian culture brings enticing charms, but for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in this part of the world, the greatest beauty of all is seen in kingdom growth. Hello to all of you who are now going to hear a little bit about our mission. God has showered us with blessings without measure and performed countless miracles through His church in this part of the world. We want you to rejoice as we rejoice in Christ and in His message of salvation for the dear and beloved inhabitants of China. The Chinese Union is based here in Hong Kong and serves the entire country of China, including Hong Kong and Macau. Our mission is summarized simply in two words, kingdom growth, to invite as many people as possible to become disciples of Jesus, then become missionaries for him to share the three angels message with their friends and families and prepare people to meet Jesus who is coming very soon. The Adventist work in China began as a calling to a lay person, Abram LaRue. He was an American seaman who became an Adventist at an advanced age. He longed to carry the Adventist message to China. The Chinese Union Mission was established in June of 1999, and it was originally under the Northern Asia Pacific Division of Seventh-day Adventist. Now, it is directly attached to the General Conference. There are wonderful, wonderful stories taking place every day across our territory, how God is using His children to grow His kingdom. Let's hear some of these stories together. Hi, Pastor Philip. I understand you have a wonderful story from a sister in China. Can you please share it with us? Thank you, Pastor Falkenberg. I'm going to share the story of Sister May. May grew up without religion in her life, but when her mother was sick, she connected with some Christian and learned few Bible verses. But unfortunately, five years later, her mother died. One day, she and her sister were in a taxi just chatting. They decided that they should find a Christian church that teaches truth. It happened to be on a Saturday. The taxi driver drove them to a Seventh-day Adventist church and dropped them off. Do you know what? Amazingly, the lady standing at the door to greet them was someone they already knew. One year later, Sister May was baptized and became very active in her church, Seventh-day Adventist Church. But life has its challenges. Eight years after becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, Sister May was diagnosed with uterine cancer. She was worried and concerned and tried to connect with specialists. May spent 19 days in a health center run by Adventist members. Here's the story. In the bed next to her was an atheist suffering from a stroke. Sister May tried to help, give her hope by sharing love of Jesus. By focusing on the needs of this hospital roommate, Sister May forgot that she was also a patient. Praise God. One day, when the doctor examined her, they discovered that the tumor was gone. Since that day, Sister May had been more committed to sharing Jesus than ever primarily through health ministry. Last year, God allowed her to give Bible study to three people that decided to be baptized. Soon, two more will be baptized. Thank you so much, Philip, for sharing that wonderful story, how God calls and then equips our new members to share the gospel with others. I'd like to transition now over to Pastor David Ng. He's gonna share with us what the churches in China have been doing to serve their communities during this terrible pandemic. Thank you, Elder Falkenberg. During the pandemic, many churches in our territory joined volunteer teams and held their communities. In 2020, during the early state of pandemic, our churches, our church donated at least 230,000 US dollars worth of goods which benefit around 80,000 people. Across China, at least 1,500 church members joined volunteer teams to serve their community. Not only that, our churches were impressed to reach beyond China's border and help brother and sister in other countries. Approximately 223,000 US dollars was donated to the General Conference for COVID-19 World Relief Efforts. In 2021, during the intense outbreak of India, 
China Seventh Day Adventist Church family gathered another seventy thousand U.S. dollars to donate to Seventh Day Adventist churches and institutions there. Thank you so much for joining us as we've had this opportunity to share with you some of the stories of God's work in China. Please remember to keep kingdom growth in China in your prayers. Chinese Union Mission, I will go. After this tour of China and the wonderful things that God is doing there, let's go to Israel to hear about the work of the church in the land of the Bible. But we will do that after the break. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Hi, B.L. How are you? Are you okay? Dear VL, I can't even remember how long we've been staying at home now because of this virus. For now, <laughs> it's just nice to hear your voice and see your face. Nothing beats playing outside in the dirt, though. Which reminds me. Are your hands clean? Yeah! Mommy and Daddy says not a lot of kids get COVID-19, but it's always nice to be extra safe. We should wash our hands. Washing our hands protects us, but it also keeps us from spreading the virus. In case we touch something dirty, let's always be clean and safe, okay? Love, Joey. We may look, pray, read, think, worship, sing, and share differently, but look forward to the Sabbath. And we all look forward to the future when Jesus will come again. With this message in mind, we arrived at a core component for a new identity system, the creation grid, a simple seven column structure for layout. The grid is a reference both to the prophetic timeline as well as to the creation week that culminated in the seventh day Sabbath. Regardless of what or where you are designing, you can always find information to help you communicate that we are all Seventh-day Adventists. Now we go to the Middle East and North Africa. The office of the Adventist Church in that region sent a video showing both the beauty and challenges found there. This territory is known as the cradle of the world. It's amazing to see what God is doing there. These are landscapes that have changed little over a millennia. Customs, beliefs, heritages, and cultures that have influenced people everywhere. People with a lot to teach and something to learn. In this region, the Adventist Church has almost 6,300 faithful members, double the number of members 10 years ago. And more than 90 home churches. However, this is not much considering there are millions of people who live here. Will you be the one? Decide now. Amen. Praise the Lord. We will continue to pray for the church in this wonderful field. In the midst of the pandemic, two men wanted an opportunity to do something meaningful for God and for others. Follow the story to find out what they accomplished. Associate Ministerial Secretary for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, Anthony Kent, and Associate Director of Health Ministry, Dr. Torben Berglund, pondered what they could do. They decided to join together to promote physical, mental, and spiritual health through I Will Go Ride. On Sunday, May 22nd, Kent Berglund and other I Will Go Ride team members 
embarked on a 1,200-mile bike ride from Washington to St. Louis to share the good news of Jesus with those they met on the road. After riding approximately 1,200 miles, the I Will Go Ride bike team arrived here in downtown St. Louis and was greeted by Adventist church leaders prior to the start of the general conference session. They arrived at the GC session in St. Louis, Missouri on Sunday afternoon, June 5th, where church leaders greeted them upon their arrival. The president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Pastor Ted Wilson, explained where Kent and Berglund found inspiration for this ministry. The I Will Go Ride journey was not an easy ride. The cyclists rode about 100 miles each day and carried literature on their uniforms, stopping only to eat, pray, hand out literature to people, and rest on the Sabbath. Uh, it's been a great journey. Uh, it's been long, but at the same time, it feels like it's very short. And it many times felt I was like it would be an endless journey. Some days have been very hard, uh, but some have just been really nice. Kenton Berglund commented, Our hope through I Will Go Ride is to see Avenues motivated and excited about evangelism. They added that their greatest desire is to bring as many people as possible to Jesus and help them prepare for his soon return. Thanks for watching ANN Video. Join us tomorrow for more news from the 61st Annual General Conference Session in St. Louis, Missouri. Don't forget to join us every day on the Adventist Church's YouTube channel for ANN In Depth and ANN Late Night, a news program specifically for young people. Just go to YouTube and search for the Adventist Church. Make sure you click on the subscribe button so you're caught up every day with news from the GC Session. You can also follow along with us live at gcsession.org live. We'll be broadcasting the full program every day along with worship, music, and evening devotionals. Before we say goodbye, here's some good news from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. The passage says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's our news for today. Remember, you can always visit Adventist.news for daily news and videos. Until tomorrow, God bless.
No. Hey guys, how are you? Welcome to a and In Depth tonight. It is eight o'clock and we're here to join you. You've just finished watching a and video, the daily program, and we will, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Sam and I are really um, excited right now on the floor. They're kind of wrapping up a lively discussion around the topic of ordination of elders. We can go back, they're, they're getting ready to vote. It's gonna be a couple of minutes before that, but Sam, while we're waiting to hear how they vote, could you talk to us a little bit about what they're discussing on the floor right now? Hi everyone, there is another live. You can go to that as well and listen to it. But now that you're here, let me update you on this. The last motion on the floor that we just left the floor, run here to the studio to bring this news to you, is that they are discussing uh, the ordination of elders. So the motion on the floor is that if somebody has been asked to serve as an elder, they should be ordained as an elder. So this is a recommendation to change the church manual to reflect that reality. Um, now, there was some contention there because there are parts of the world that don't uh, ordain women elders and other parts of the world that do. So there was an assumption, that question, hold on a minute, does it mean that? No, it me simply means that if an area of the world uh, ordains women elders, if they ask someone to be an elder, they should be ordained as an elder. Yeah. That's the motion. So somebody asked for the motion to be sent back to the committee to discuss this further. And then I think they withdrew that motion just before I left. Yeah. And we don't know exactly what the vote is, uh, but we will bring you that information right. in depth tomorrow. Or if, if while we're still recording, they tell us, then they'll let us know and we, we will put let that you in. know as well. Because we have people who help us with those things. Yes, Sam. I can see them in the background. Yeah, they're looking, they're listening in the background. So today we, we already had Anne in depth at 12.30. We talked about the, what was happening in, during the morning and we, we talked about what was coming up. And we had a celebration to kick off the day at, at two after lunch. We welcomed 10 unions into the, uh, the Fellowship of Unions or the Sisterhood of Unions. And that's really exciting because that means, like we said earlier, the church is growing. It's growing so fast. And Sam, you said, what is it, a million people in Zimbabwe? Almost a million, 850,000 yeah. or so. So in Zimbabwe, I'm going to read these um, these unions that we welcomed in. Yeah. Zimbabwe Central Union Conference, the Zimbabwe East Union, Zimbabwe West Union Conference. So Zimbabwe got divided into three. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The vote is in. Um, majority chose not to refer back to the committee. So they accepted the motion. There you go. There, there you go. have it. So we accepted it. That's great. Okay, so we're going to the Sisterhood of Church of Unions, um, and we'll go back into the into what happened a little bit later um, tomorrow. Sure. Sure. So we had the Zimbabwe East Union and the Zimbabwe West Union Conference, and Belize Union Mission, the Northern Ghana Union Conference, the Netherlands Union of Churches Conference, the Malaysian Union Mission and the Southeastern Asia Union Mission. And finally, we had the Eastern European Union Mission and the Western Ethiopian Union Mission. And so we praise God for these new unions. We praise God that they, our church is growing and we ask that you guys pray for them. But Sam, tell, the, tell us again, what's a union? Because people might be like, okay. What, what is, is a union, union? right? Is well, it we anything to do with labor <laughs> unions? No, it doesn't. Let me tell you about the structure of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is how the church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church works. When a group of Seventh-day Adventists start meeting in a, in any particular neighborhood, we call that a group, or sometimes it's called a, a, a branch Sabbath school, something like that, but it's a group. When they start growing a little bit more, they become a company. And then when they are self-sustained and they have enough tithe and offerings to maintain themselves, they become a local church. There are about 162,000 of those in the world between the three of them, groups, companies, and churches. And just to put it into perspective, I like to mention this because it does yeah. put it into perspective. For every McDonald's that there is in the world, there are four Seventh-day Adventist congregations, either a group, a company, or a church. Organized churches, there are over 80,000 full churches. A group of those in a given geography is called a conference. 
So in the Seventh-day Adventist church, let me go into it in depth. In a regular church, let's say a evangelical church or most Christian denominations, the tithe and offering that is giving and the management happens in the local church. For the Seventh-day Adventist church, it doesn't happen like that. All of the tithe that is collected in all of these churches in a given location is taken to the conference. And that local conference understands the geography and distributes the funds to the pastors that are full-time helping to provide pastoral care, nurture, and evangelism for that location. And we do this because of mission. There are areas in every conference that are we call it unreached which simply means that there is no Adventist congregation there proclaiming the three angels' messages because that's our goal as a church. Our goal as a church is to communicate. Mm. The structure of the Adventist church is a response to our mission to communicate. We were communicating these special messages from God before we had a structure. We only have a structure to enable to, to amplify uh, the communication that we believe God has asked us to do. Right. Now... I remember growing up, my mom would come to the conference president and she would say, point me on the map, a place that does not have a Seventh-day Adventist church. Mm. And the president would say, okay, this town here doesn't. And then she would say, prepare a Bible worker because in six months, there will be a group there meeting and then they can, you can form a church out of that. And she would go home, convince my dad, and they would <laughs> move to that city. Must be fun for you. It, it, for me, it was fine. For my dad, not so much. So they would, um, she would visit lots of houses and start giving Bible studies. And sure enough, in six months, there mm -hmm. were three or four families worshiping on the Sabbath. And the conference used the funds from the other churches to sponsor a, a Bible worker, an evangelist, a missionary, to go to that town and take over for my mom as she moved somewhere else to plant yet another mm -hmm. church. Those funds are important. And that's how the Adventist church has grown so much. Yeah, A group of conferences forms a union here we are we find the word union landed landed so a union that's all it is is a group of conferences yeah. there are some exceptions to that in europe you have um union of churches so it's not that they have uh, lots of conferences they have a union of churches and what does that mean it means that they don't have conferences under them yes but they function as a union for all intents and purposes mm -hmm. a group of unions does not form a division Nope. Right? We think it, it does. It, most people think it does, but it doesn't. It forms the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists has lots of unions that are part of it. And in order for it to lead in, in the regards that it needs to lead, mm -hmm. it functions through its 13 divisions and attached fields. Right. So the North American Division, for example. Which is where we are. Which is where we are, is one of those divisions. Uh, and it has many unions under mm -hmm. it, and that's how the work goes forward across the world. And at every level, the same thing applies. There are regions that cannot be reached, so we take the collective funds and structure to enable mission to those regions that have not been reached yet. Yeah, and now we have 10 new unions who are enabled for mission. We've welcomed them and today. we've welcomed, yeah. So right after the welcoming of the Sister Churches, Dr. Ella Simmons, who is um, a general vice president, and she's actually retiring. This was, her, I think, her last time she was chairing a committee, but she let, allowed the nominating committee to go meet. So the nominating committee is now meeting, and when we know if there is a voted position that they have something to say about, then we will we'll let you know if we're here. Um, Kenya and Wenya at 9.30 might let you know if they're there or if we'll, we'll put it on social media, but they're nominating our committee is meeting right now and so pray for them like we said earlier and then the afternoon session sam was constitution and bylaw amendments that sounds boring it wasn't <laughs> i don't think it was the items were presented by hensley Morovan. it does if anybody knows hensley and hensley can make anything sound interesting and beautiful and he explained everything perfectly so um, most of the stuff that was there was voted to approve. They only sent one back to the committee. And that was actually really interesting. Um, front Frontline workers. There was a lot of discussion about frontline workers. There was workers. a lot of discussion about frontline workers. And so they wanted to change some of the wording to frontline workers. But some people in different parts of the world, they have 
a different understanding of what that means. You know, we're a global church and a frontline worker in, in, in the United States might mean one thing and another part of the world it means another. So they they send it back. This is, again, we talk about the struggle. What does it mean when we struggle with something? It means we sit down and we say, hey, this word isn't the best word we can use right now. Let's pick a different word. And so that um, sent it back to yeah. the committee. All of the items that come to the floor of a general conference session, they have been discussed and read. And if you right. notice in the agenda, if you have the agenda, you will notice on the top of an item, you have lots of little nomenclatures, lots of little words that go through. Um, what are those little terms? Every committee that has looked at it. Right. So usually it's at least five, seven, ten, some more. Right. And this means multiple committees are looking at this item. They are struggling with the language. They are going over it again and again and again. And when one committee is happy to say, this is what we want to say, mm -hmm. then the next committee picks it up and refines it further. Right. Does it mean that whatever comes to the floor is voted? Clearly not. Right. When you bring 2,000, 3,000 people together to go over it, you begin to have nuances that you did not anticipate before. Right. And that's the pro it's, it's a painful process. But it is a beautiful process because by the end of it, when you do get a change that is there, it reflects that how the Holy Spirit has been leading different parts of the right. world. Yeah, it was really interesting. And I, I want to just mention really quickly, one of the, the wonderful things about the way that we discuss things like as a when we discuss things in church is the way we explain things so that things that are controversial may not be controversial. You know, so there's always a rationale for how we do things. So one of the things they discussed today was that um, because in in the past that um, <clears throat> the treasurer and the secretary of the North America division have always been associate secretaries and treasurers of the general conference. Well, you know, the, the North America division, they moved out and of our building. They used to share a building with us and we miss them because we all have friends, but they moved out. And in order to make it fair all the way around the world, They've decided to no longer have that, where the North American Div Division Secretary and Treasurer are no longer associates. That was decided by the committee in the past. And because it could seem like it's it could be a contentious issue, but because the, the committees went through and they worded it and they explained it and they understood it, we were able to come together and agree that this is the way we should move forward. Another item that was changing the language around authorized unauthorized speakers let, let me say something about the north american division yes I, please do because there's a history here right in the past there was no such thing as the north american division mm. up until the 90s i think the general conference was the was the, was acting within north america mm -hmm. and then as we grew to different parts of the world there came a need in order to fulfill mission faster better right. you know more more powerfully we decided that we would create the north american division right and we have been in the process of detaching the North American division from the general conference so that they can operate in this territory and the general conference can do its job in different parts of the world in the same way as we work with other right. divisions. So this was another step in that process. Right. We don't do things rashly. We don't do things quickly. No. Sometimes it's very frustrating how long it takes for us to do things um, because the church is, is a very large church but we do them right. so in in slow steps so that there is no jittering uh, but this was another step toward right. that the other thing that another item that they, that was talking was language around unauthorized speakers sam you've been a local pastor you sometimes have people come to your churches and speak who um are not you as the pastor when we talk about ensuring pastors um or when we talk about unauthorized pastors, can you just tell us a little bit what we mean? And then I can talk a little bit about what the discussion on the floor was surrounding that. So a local congregation generally has a pulpit in its main area mm -hmm. and other rooms, you know, across the church. We take the pulpit, we take that, we call it a platform because usually it's raised from yeah. the rest. We take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, we take it seriously because people in the past have tried to make that into a political arena where they can bring their own uh, uh, favorite political, you know, uh, mm -hmm. local elections. They try to influence that within the church. We say no. Right. Other people try to sell products in the past. We say no. Mm -hmm. Other people. So there are a number of things that can happen from that platform. So we say 
the local church pastor is responsible for what is said in a pulpit. Right. So in a local church, my elders were free to send people to me and say, Pastor, I suggest that this uh, person, he or she, can do a great job doing this. And then I will have a chat with them and I would trust them and I would ask them to come and share something right. useful with the congregation. And the conference usually has guidelines surrounding that. A sure. A local conference will have guidelines. That's right. Because right. the pastors work within the context of a local conference. So what the manual has done now is that it's clarified that language a little more. Right. Because there are some parts of the world that you have one pastor for 20 churches. Wow. So, or 30 churches. I've heard of a pastor that has 75 churches. I mean, what, what does that look like? Other what, parts what of the world. What is the Sabbath like? What? <laughs> Yeah, he's all week actually. <laughs> and there are some pastors that take hours, sometimes yeah. days on a boat to get to their congregations, yeah. depending on where they are. So the local uh, leadership, the church happens because local elders and deacons and the, and the church board and all the department leaders, they effectively ran the church. Right. And they invite all sorts of people to come and speak. The church manual has made it clear that the pastor should be involved in that process. And he should follow the, the conference guidelines right. accordingly. It's just a clarification of what already has taken place in most Seventh-day Adventist churches. Right. Sometimes, Jennifer, there is tension. Sometimes there is a particular elder that wants this other person to come and speak. And for whatever reason, the pastor does not feel confident that this other person will speak, um, will refrain from things that we don't do from the pulpit. And sometimes right. there is tension between pastors and local elders. And now the manual has tried to remove that tension by making it clear. So, and that's the purpose of the church manual right. is to provide clarity and the collective wisdom of tens of thousands of churches around the world for decades. And this is all available in a short book. And we've edited <laughs> this book today right. in different ways. Yeah. And, and the conversation surrounding that was just basically them agreeing that they wanted the church board and the, and the local pastors to have more influence, you know, in consultation again with the conference. So that was a discussion, but again, it was voted. So today we had a lot of these bylaws and constitution church manual, manual issues. And um, right now they're still going. And um, we will talk about what they are going to do, what, what, they, what we missed, because we're missing something. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. Yes. But what is happening tomorrow, Sam? Do you know what's happening tomorrow? No. I know me. what's happening tomorrow. Tell me. Tomorrow is the Secretariat Report. And the Secretariat Report is will be given by um, Pastor Erton Kohler. He was just elected. Yeah, I saw at, GT here too. Elder, yeah. Elder Ng was also here. I right. saw him um, at, I in, yesterday. Yeah, so uh, Pastor Kohler will be giving his sec first Secretariat for, uh, Report to session. And um, what is the Secretariat Report? Because to me, it's, it's a really cool report. Yeah, it, it's really the numbers, the data, yeah. the, the focus on missionaries. And in the case of the General Conference, the Secretariat is responsible for that mission element right. of expanding into new territories. Sometimes people ask, what is Secretariat in charge of? Everything. <laughs> I mean, they have such a wide variety of things. You know, when we talk about archive statistics and research, statistics, and research, that's under Secretariat. When we talk about Adventist mission, that's under Secretariat. When we talk about um, missionaries, that's under Secretariat. The, you see Hensley, he's the undersecretary. He's been running, you know, sort of explaining all this. So this session planning and that's, that's under Secretariat. So we get to hear the report about missionaries and um, you're, you know, you're an interdivisional employee. Yes. Correct? That's right. under Secretariat. Yes. So we get to hear all about all. And so that's tomorrow. And the other thing that's tomorrow morning is the treasurer's report. Yes. And for me, I'm a communication person. I don't do well with numbers, but I still find the treasurer's report very interesting. And what I've always loved, you know, Pastor Prestall was our former treasurer. And now we have Paul Douglas. And what I love about their treasurer's report is the spiritual emphasis they place on even our numbers and how God is providing for us. I mean, if you really want to know how God is working in the church, listen to how God has provided for us during COVID. Yeah. And so you will not want to miss the, the treasures report. And especially if you are a nerd, a numbered nerd, <laughs> you're going to love it. I, but this pastoral element is really right. important. Um, when I first joined ministry, I had a treasurer in the union. Uh, his name was Victor Pilmore. 
-hmm. And the treasurer at the conference, Earl Rumharaxon was his name. And they had this idea that uh, your budget, your church budget, um, these are your dreams with price tags. Yeah. And I love that concept because we dream of mission. We right. dream of reaching people. We dream of of going further, of, of finishing this mission God has given us. And that means being good stewards right. of the funds that uh, God has given to his church through its members. Right. So that's really what this is, is we dream of mission. Okay, there is a price tag to that. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we going to invest those resources as good stewards? Right. That's the, and so that's why I like the, the, the yeah. treasury report. Now seven years, we will look into this. And the secretariat report looks at the growth. And one right. of the things to expect tomorrow is that this, uh, this growth to be more realistic than in the past. Right. Over the last seven years and perhaps longer, many of our world feuds, our local churches, our conferences, unions within divisions, they have been doing this work of membership audit. Yeah. Which is essentially, it's a very much a pastoral work. It's every local church going through the list of members and going, where is Sister Robinson? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen her in a while. Okay, Sister Robinson, I don't know. Two people knew her. Right. And it's been a while. Where is she gone? Can we get in contact with her? So if we can, we try for a, a number of months, I think two, up to two years or something like that, for a period of time. And when we, if, if we cannot get hold of Sister Robinson, we mm -hmm. don't know where they are, then we move to remove her from the membership of that local church, right. which is a very solemn thing that we do. Right. Now We in, try to be redemptive. Absolutely. All of that is, is redemptive. Right. But we, we have seen... Um, year on year, thousands, tens of thousands of people being removed from the church books simply because they no longer are in touch with an Adventist church. Right. Yeah. So we're going to have that secretary's report. We're going to have the treasurer's report. Obviously, what everybody's waiting for, the nominating committee will hopefully come back with, with recommendations to be voted. And then we're going to have more church manual amendment recommendations. So more changes to the church manual. I, we don't know because depending, it's very interesting because people will say, well, what are they voting on tomorrow? But we don't know because it depends how far they get today. And then tomorrow they'll decide a set and they'll go as far as they can. And then we'll see how far we get on Wednesday. So the, that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And so tomorrow morning, we'll be talking a little bit more about what we missed tonight. We're going to talk about the treasurer's and secretary's report. This is at 1230. So don't miss it. I do want to talk a little bit. You know, we had um, a and Daily was right before us. They they talked video, yeah. a and Video Daily. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I produced the program for 12 years. You think I know <laughs> what the title is? <laughs> nope. <laughs> but they talked about the I Will Go ride. They had mission reports. I really hope that if you missed it and you're watching this, you go back and you watch it. Because as Sam and I mentioned on Friday, we are going to have all 13 mission reports from the divisions and every night or every day at 7:30, we preview two or three of those on ANN yeah. video. So we hope that you go back and you watch that program for mission stories as well. You know, they're going to recap the president's report. We talked about that this morning. What a beautiful president's report. There was a, there was a baptism, a general from the Philippines was baptized. I mean, it was like you talked about, it was, we're talking about redemption. We're talking about restitution of relationships. We're talking about friendship and relationships and forgiveness that was all in the president's report and that was previewed and highlighted in tonight's a &M video so if you missed that we hope you go back and watch it because there's some beautiful stories in there tonight and we're really excited because you know what tonight is what is it tonight kicks off a &M late night ish late night ish yes. in how long jennifer i think it's about an hour i don't in know what time it is hour, right now sam in about an hour come back to yeah this youtube channel the world church youtube channel yeah and you will have the show called a &M late night Ish, ish because it's not really it's not really late night late here <laughs> but i you know i've been talking to kenya and wenya today i've seen some of the work they've done i've seen the inner you know they're going to interview dion from the trans-european division dan will be interviewed he it's, is being interviewed be and he is and carlos from sab okay. together excellent so we're going to hear from two of our youth directors from, the, from ted and from um, south american division and they're going to interview them they're going to interview a young adult who is a translator here um they have a video package with him and they're going to give you the top five things that happened today that young people should know about. So Fantastic. that's going to be at nine 30 and I'm really excited to see how they come off because they're excited. They have a great energy, especially when they're together and 
I can't wait. I can't either. I'm going to be sitting over here with the crew, just like holding my breath, I think. <laughs> so we're excited. Go ahead. No, that's it. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so happy to be with you each night of session. Um, we will be here again tomorrow night. Well, we'll be here tomorrow at 1230 and then again at 8. And we really hope that you tune every night in every night at 730 for a &M video and at 930 for a &M late night-ish. If you have if you want to keep up during the day when we're not on TV, which it seems like we're on TV pretty much the full time, 24 hours a day, um, Adventist.news has daily news and videos. You guys are Adventist News on Twitter. Yes, at Adventist News at on Adventist Twitter. Twitter. Every motion, every at, delegate comment, yeah. it's intense. Doing a fabulous job. And then also some of our stories are on Facebook at the Adventist Church. So please make sure that you're joining us on social media, that you're joining us on YouTube. And you, you just hang out with us. We're so happy to have you and to be with you. And for another great summary of the day throughout, uh, the Adventist Review is publishing a whole magazine in PDF. You can go to AdventistReview.org yeah. and you can download that and read the PDF to your heart's content right. with the full summary of today. Yeah, It's your church. We hope that you keep up with it and you, you just follow along with our news. Until tomorrow, God bless. Bye. Bye.